This podcast is sponsored by Flash Talking. And in case you didn't hear, they've got a Super Bowl ad. Wait, can I say Super Bowl or do I have to say big game? I don't know. Okay, well, Flash Talking's got a big game ad. You can check it out at flashtalking.com slash big game. You'll also find a hidden camera prank with improv everywhere and other fun marketing to unleash the power of creative and make ads people want to see. So go to flashtalking.com slash big game for more. And I got to say it, this ad could have been an email. Welcome to the Architecture Podcast. I'm Ari Paparo. I'm joined today by Eric Franchi and our special guest, Mike Driscoll, the CEO of Real Data. Mike, thank you for being here. Great to be here, Ari and Eric. Thanks for having me. We're excited to have Mike here because we're calling this the tech episode. We're going to go deep on tech. Mike, unlike me, is a real technologist, not like one of these people who stumbled into it by cutting and pasting ad tags around. He knows what he's talking about. Um, but before we do some quick housekeeping, so a reminder that the Architecture newsletter now has original content written by me, and as well as all the links we discuss in this podcast, you should su subscribe to it at news.marchitecture.tv. All right. So, Mike, you and I ran into each other at a conference, and you said to me, ad tech is to technology innovation what porn is to media innovation. Uh, and that, that alone said, I have to have him on the podcast. Um, so I, wanted, I want to explore that. And then after that, we're going to go into the epic story of meta markets and real and the most convoluted series of transactions anyone's ever heard of. So let's go first with your hypothesis. What do you mean by this? There's a... Uh famous quote from the bank robber Willie Sutton uh, when he was asked, you know, why do you rob banks? And his answer was, that's where the money is. And if you're someone like me who loves data uh, and technology, I think if you're to ask, you know, why I got into media and advertising, digital media and advertising, it's, it's that's where the data was. When I reflect back, you know, 2010, when I first got recruited to start Metamarkets with my co-founder, David Soloff. I had come a couple of years earlier out of a computational biology PhD program. And really what fascinated me and what drew me in was this is an incredible arena to be a crucible of innovation for data infrastructure and technology. So it continues to be, I think, on the on the leading edge of that, and uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, doesn't maybe have the same <laughs> salacious undertones of pornography, <laughs> but uh, certainly I think maybe porn porn does drive digital media, and digital media drives technology infrastructure. So instead of curing Alzheimer's, you decided to make people click on ads. It is true that. Uh, I found that I was more interested in the scale and the velocity and the volume of, of digital media data than I was. And uh, at the time, I was studying Schuonella onidensis, which was a ocean bacteria. Um, so to be honest, fishy smelling bacteria in the lab were not, uh, not quite up there with um, curing Alzheimer's. So um, porn gave us the VCR and the DVR. Um, what has ad tech given us? Well, I think if you kind of look back um, at some of the early history of cloud computing and distributed computing, probably the, the biggest breakthroughs that we've seen in terms of software architectures started probably with the publication that Google had of their MapReduce paper. So Google published, they never published the actual software. Google's not into open source software, but they are into kind of open architecture. And that MapReduce algorithm was really, I was like looking it up. I think it was sort of written back in uh, 2004. It was really their approach for processing you know, the vast amounts of, of click logs, um, advertising logs, search logs. And that gave birth to what became Apache Hadoop. If you think about sort of you know, the, the beginnings of um, big data and really, I, I think the rise of kind of data science and ultimately what, what Really, I, I think there is lineage uh, that traces uh, and supports, you know, the beginning of a lot of the machine learning and AI work that's going on today. It did kind of start with that MapReduce paper that Google wrote, which was 
their approach to how on earth can we make sense of all of this data? We've got to find a way to you know charge our customers. I think yeah that that was probably one of the biggest breakthroughs. And then you had things like Apache Spark, and that led to Databricks. You know things like Apache Kafka. You had a whole slew of open source distributed data technologies that emerged really in the last, you know, we're now looking at the two decade anniversary of that MapReduce paper. And a lot of those technologies cut their teeth in digital media and advertising. Probably most recently, the most exciting company that's grown uh, as a innovative data business has been Snowflake. And if you look at Snowflake's early trajectory, a lot of their early customers were gaming and marketing. And we should, uh, hey, it's Eric, uh, we should disclose that where I work up here and we're, we're an investor in, in real data. Um, and I think after the past couple of minutes of listening to Mike, everybody can understand why. Uh, didn't MongoDB uh, get its start, you know, just like focusing on ad tech as a, as a sector? Are you familiar with that one? Absolutely. So I probably have a little bit of a West Coast bias, but, you know, Dwight Merriman, Elliot Horowitz, Kevin Ryan, the team behind DoubleClick, clearly... Um, recognize the need for you know uh, faster better more scalable database infrastructure uh, mongodb continues to be an incredibly uh, i think they they did a billion dollars of revenue in 2023 an incredibly successful company you know direct descendant from ad tech innovation and, and speaking of databases you your the database you created darwin is a major open source initiative that came out of ad tech right so uh, Apache Druid. Um, Sorry, Druid, uh, not Darwin. I knew I had Druid. That's okay. <laughs> there's so many. Even I knew that one. <laughs> so many. There's many different uh, uh, animals in the uh, in the in the technology zoo, but Apache Druid was was absolutely a, a database that we created. I think the first lines of code for Druid were written in, gosh, 2011, and the, we built it because we. You know, we didn't have anything else that was fast enough to power the kinds of interactive dashboards that you know, MetaMarkets was selling. So, you know, like a lot of things today, there's lots of alternatives out there. Um, I, I wouldn't advocate a startup to roll its own database. That's kind of the really the last thing you want to do in a startup is have to invent um, something like a database or an operating system um, or a web framework. But in our case, that bet paid off. Right. What do you think the role is in general or the interaction is between open source software and the ad tech ecosystem? It seems like there's a lot of give and take there. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the reasons why ad tech is the mother of a lot of invention is that ad tech, if I if I give her a gender, you know, she is a uh a very cost sensitive mother. And so unlike other industries, you know, all the transactions, and this is one of the appeals of ad tech, all the, all the transactions are you know, dollar denominated or you know, currency denominated. And, and it's very easy for companies to figure out what, they're, what you know, the cost to serve advertising is, um, what, what the cost to purchase advertising. And as a result, I think there's incredible economic pressures to deliver uh, technology uh, not just you know in a performant way, but in an efficient, a cost-efficient way. And so, with those pressures, open source becomes quite appealing because open source is free. Uh, now, it does have a higher bar of, of engineering talent, but I think if you look, you know, even in the case of meta markets, the number of ad tech companies that were using Apache Druid versus the number of ads was much higher than the number of ad tech companies that were subscribers to the meta markets SaaS platform. So yeah, ad tech companies in general are big consumers of open source because of the economics of the industry. So so as a CEO who did open source some of your core technology, we're going to get into the epic story of meta markets in a moment. But do you have any guidance for someone maybe in a product role or CEO role thinking about how they may open source some of their tech to their advantage? I mean, today the world the world has shifted quite a bit um, from where it was, you know, let's say ten or fifteen years ago in the earlier days of open source. I think that companies are more, I think, more willing to pay for fully managed services. I think Snowflake has shown um, that. I think companies recognize that 
you know, they're not in the business of maybe managing uh, infra the way they, they might have thought they were 10 or 15 years ago. So I'll start with that, which is, I think the desire for companies to use and maintain open source internally has gone down more th- uh, today than, than it was 10 or 15 years ago. But in terms of that decision, the calculus of, you know, should I open source my tool or not? I think open source fundamentally is a distribution strategy for startups. You know, the goal of every startup is that people know that you exist and they know that you solve a problem. You've got to get awareness and proof that you solve a problem before you can claim, you know, think about how to commercialize it. So I think open source is one of many distribution strategies out there. Um, It's not the only one, but if your target customer is a developer, I think it can be a very effective strategy because developers generally don't want to talk to you know, sales folks, uh, they just want to be able to try stuff. So uh, and the last thing I'll say about open source is I don't think there's one playbook. There's many different flavors of open source kind of playbooks um, out there. Yeah, we flirted with it quite a bit at Beeswax uh, because when we started the company Beeswax, there were two or three open source bidders. Um, there was the one from um, oh, RTB Kit. There was Google's mm-hmm. Open Project, and I think AppNexus had a long shelved Java one. And uh, we ended up not pursuing that uh, because we felt that the bidder wasn't its own technology. It, it wasn't identifiable as one thing that could be open source and then built around. It was so convoluted; it got its arms into everything. But it was interesting. If you look at our first pitch deck for our seed round, it basically said, we're going to take open source bidders and put them in the cloud. Which I think exactly. I think that's the common commercial strategy for open source is, hey, the software is free, but the cloud version is you know, what, what people will pay for. I think in general, open source projects do better as infrastructure. So databases, operating systems, I've not seen open source as successful as you kind of move up the stack. People are kind of looking for something they can just like plug in and where the perimeters of the software are kind of well-defined. And so I could see something like a bidder, maybe those perimeters are not so clean. That's the bet with, with Meta and Llama. Yeah. It's like, you know, just the, the, the most foundational thing that, you know, you can have, right, is, is the large language model. And, you know, the, the question is, you know, by going open source, can, you know, they then start to empower all of these developers, all, all of these startups in a way that, you know, could potentially allow, allow them to outflank, you know, everybody, including open AI. Right. And, and in some cases, again, every open source strategy kind of is, is different, but you could imagine that for some companies, it's not, there's, there is no commercial strategy behind it. It's in, in some ways, open source kind of starts to approach things like open standards, right? Where I think when we talk about these, these AI you know, foundation models, the goal is that if you're building your business on some foundation, you would much prefer that foundation to be an open standard than a closed standard that's controlled by one company. And so in case of Facebook, they make so much money in other lines of business that they can afford to just create an open standard foundation model, open source it, make no money on it, but deprive OpenAI and Microsoft and others from creating lock-in on a proprietary standard. That would ultimately, so it's more like protecting downside than it is creating upside. Right. And and I think it it's worth talking about the fact that in ad tech, there have been a number of very successful open open source projects, most notably Prebid, uh, which has a thriving mm-hmm. ecosystem, as well as standards. So you differentiate between technology and standards. The, the IB Tech Lab has done a great job of pushing forward. Um, well, just an obscure topic I'd love to ask you about. Why are there no good key value store databases that are open source? Everyone continue, Every single ad tech company in the world would like to use an open source key value store, and then they try them, and they fail, and they end up using Aerospike and paying them millions of dollars a year. Yeah, I, I do remember, Ari, you and I ran, bumped into each other at a conference uh, maybe a few years back. And that was one of the ideas that you pitched uh, to me as, hey, why is there not a better open source key value store out there? My take on that is, you know, there, there are some pretty good key value stores out there. Redis is probably the most popular one um, out there. But clearly, ad tech has a level of a use case that might be so particular 
so low latency that Aerospike has kind of filled that niche and and the open source tools just you know don't kind of get to that level of performance. That's my hypothesis. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And the re, the quick answer why I didn't pursue that was, uh, while everyone I talked to said, yeah, we'd love to have a better key value store, the idea of switching was so daunting to people that it was yes. just impossible. Yes. All right, I want to talk about better market. So me personally and my company, Beeswax, have had this incredibly intertwined relationship with meta markets and then with real and it's just ridiculous so i want to go through it like do a timeline here um so um Meta Markets, for those of you who don't know, is an amazing data visualization tool around uh, primarily around ad tech data and i guess we'll start the story in like 2015 when rumors came out that both beeswax and meta markets were being approached to be acquired by snapchat Beeswax, we had we were in beta at the time, and the rumors were true. Like we had a term sheet to sell Beeswax to Snap, and I guess the rumors were true for you as well. It's really funny when you think back to like how these rumors um, get out there. I think maybe as a preface, which is you know uh, don't always believe what you read in the news. Um, I think that somebody saw me having a lunch in Vegas with. The uh, with Imram, who was at that time, Imran Khan, who Imran was at Khan. that time the chief strategy officer at Snap. Now, that lunch, to be totally candid, in 2015, that lunch at CES was was just brokered by you know our friends Media Link. They said, "Hey, you should sit down with Imran." Someone must have seen that, um, and and meanwhile, they obviously were. I actually think this is a case of mistaken identity, Ari. I think that someone saw us talking to Snap, heard that there was a you know potential term sheet out for beeswax, and they just conflated the two and said, but it, it was true two years later. Two years later, they actually did, of course. No, I will confirm that we had a term sheet from them. There was an all-stock deal. We were in beta. It, while the top-line number was very attractive for a company that hadn't accomplished anything, it was all stock, and we didn't like it, so we, we turned it down. Then, now this is the less fun part By the way, of the story. Maybe, maybe I have you to thank for that, Ari, because it's sort of that you incepted the idea through, a, I guess, a, a journalist got confused, thought meta markets you know, might, might be you gained a right. car by snap and then the rumor became reality uh thanks to you <laughs> okay so so metamarkets is chugging along and then you had open sourced your database and basically a bunch of your employees left stole your ideas stole your database and started a new company is that accurate the you know reality is more more complicated i think what we saw what um when we were at metamarkets was that apache druid was really gaining momentum as an open source project and I think we we did kind of have a fork in the road. Um, at one point, I wrote a I wrote a memo for the board, considering formally spinning out Apache Druid as a sort of standalone business. And to be honest, like we you know that just wasn't the business we were in, right? We were we were chugging along. We were you know uh, into double digit you know millions of revenue. We finally, you know, ironically. As Apache Druid started to take off, the meta markets business also started to gain real traction and kind of repeatable sales motion in media and advertising. So we kind of had this choice, like, do we go chase this shiny new thing? Could be a huge distraction. And, and ultimately, what we, we had engineers very excited. Obviously, they had been working in the background promoting this open source project. You know, They came to me and said, we'd like to spin out. And I actually introduced them to Coastal Ventures, who wrote their first seed check. And that was all uh, well and good. But on, on the way out, I sort of asked them, we're not a database company. Uh, as long as you focus on the database, great. There's obviously tons of money to be made in databases. Um, but what did happen is they also uh, took some of the dashboard code uh, with them. <laughs> and so, you know, I think no one ever thinks they're doing anything wrong. Uh, but at the time, that was definitely not okay uh, with us. And uh, what I do recall is that. Smato, which was one of our bigger customers, got access to essentially not just a free Druid, but they they were able to download a free version of the dashboard product and they canceled their contract. Oh my God. And Kosla was so, your top VC as well, right? That's right. Okay. So, so Kosla, yeah. <laughs> All right. So he had a broker. Ultimately, we we um look, it, it was only a couple of years between that and when we sold the snap. So 
what I can say is as we were negotiating the SNAP acquisition, Kosla was uh, you know, a little late to sign the term sheet or you know, to sign essentially the, you know, the merger agreement. And ultimately, it was because they, they were like, listen, we want to make sure we have this other portfolio company given a free and clear reprieve from any IP issues. And if you can do that, then we can sign this, uh, this oh, deal. Oh, man. That's a, that's a serious conflict of interest. Um, <laughs> that's whatever the, happened to the company? Uh, they're doing, I think, quite... I, you know, by 2021 valuations quite well. I think that they've, they raised, you know, several rounds since. So I think they're doing well. And I think they, they, they were able to, you know, sell that database product to, you know, multiple verticals. It's a much more competitive landscape. So today I would say the company that probably is most following in the footsteps of Apache Druid and what, you know, the, the philosophy of that uh, technology is a company called ClickHouse. That came out of Yandex, and ClickHouse is an incredibly powerful uh, backend that, again, lots of ad tech companies are using. It's a great Eastern European name. We are ClickHouse. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so you get acquired. So Snap acquires you, and why does Snap acquire you? I think the logic of the deal for them was simply to accelerate their monetization yeah. machinery. They had not. Right? So, and they get you right. and some tech and some smart people. Right? Exactly. Now the the irony, of course, you know, look when you're a buyer in an M and A deal, it's like you you bought the you bought the house, you could do what you want with it. They valued us for the tech and the and you know work backwards from you know uh, to net present value for future acceleration of you know monetization. And at that point, they were kind of on the up and up. They felt like they were on top of the world. I think their market cap, which has been a roller coaster, but at that point was north of ten billion, and so. I think, yeah, it was just an acceleration play. On the other hand, they got an asset that was generating real meaningful right, revenue. Right. All right. Now, here's where it gets broke. Uh, a couple of years go by. You're like kind of on your way out or maybe you're out already. I don't know the details. I get some rumors that maybe Snap wants to sell MetaMarkets, uh, spin it out. So I reach out to CorpDev as the CEO of Beeswax because I'm really interested in buying it. Beeswax is a big customer. Ah. Our customers love it. And combining the bidder with the analytics makes a lot of sense to me. They don't respond to my emails. Like, they just do not respond. Even though I'm talking to the right person, uh, and I know it's for sale, for some reason they don't respond. A couple months later, press comes out that my good friend and Beeswax investor, Jim Payne, former CEO of Mopub, um, has purchased MetaMarkets and created a new company called Facet. I talked to Jim, and Jim says, oh, man, you made us pay so much. You were bidding so hard. And I was like, dude, <laughs> I wasn't at the table. <laughs> You got you got rooked here, man. So wow! Got, like, hey, you got overbid, Ari and Beeswax. They're plenty plus. <laughs> I did not bid a single thing. Whoa! But Jim's wow. a good poker player. He got a great deal. So the yes. deal Jim got, I hope I don't think I'm breaching any confidentiality here. But it was an amazing deal. Where basically he got all the revenue and none of the hassle. He he basically right. Snap kept the tech internal and kept all the billing relationships and would just pay Jim all the revenue. And all Jim had to do, yes. I guess, was keep the customers happy. Yes. What a deal. Did you join it for a minute? I did. I mean, so it was, you know, Jim is an incredible deal maker. And, and you know, as for the speaking of uh, ad tech veterans joining boards, you know, one of the first things I did after Jim sold Mopub to Twitter, Twitter ultimately became, was the largest customer of MetaMarkets um, uh, at one point. Again, I think I'm breaking confidentiality there. It was a seven figures a month spend on, right. on the platform. So I called Jim and said, hey, join the board. And he was instrumental also in the exit to Snap. I think he's trusted by you know uh, folks uh, across the industry. He was able to you know kind of broker. And then it was I I actually will always remember he called me one day. He's like you know, he's on the tarmac, you know, Jim's a pilot. He's always often stopping somewhere in the middle of the country, you know, fueling up. And he calls me and says, hey, Mike, I was just sitting here on the tarmac and I thought, we should buy MetaMarkets back. <laughs> it's like, I always love that tool. If, man, it'd be all, like, what do you think? And I'm like, Jim, listen, you're the only one who could pull that deal off. I mean, it, it's a complex deal. It's not, you know, it's not like it's going to be, you know, a huge uh, number. So, so Jim worked for months negotiating the terms of that spin out. I did join Jim and I, I, I said, Jim, look, I, if you want to be the CEO, that's great. I you'd be, think you'd be phenomenal. 
But I think two things ultimately led me to, to not stay with, with that. One is, I think that Jim is just too rich to be you know, working uh, uh, 80 hours a week as a startup CEO. <laughs> so I don't think he really had the fire in the belly to, to, to you know, rebuild yeah. a startup. I, I love Jim, but second, last time I saw him, he was telling me about how he was um, renting a helicopter to go see his horse at the Preakness. <laughs> exactly. So he's got some other extracurriculars that you know aren't aren't necessarily consonant with uh, the startup grind. I think second, and I think Jim's his realization was correct, but I, I I fundamentally wanted to go in a different direction. Jim wanted to build the Meta Markets application and have it just run on other data warehouses like Snowflake and BigQuery. And my strong conviction was that you could not deliver the kind of user experience that we were known for and loved for with the MetaMarkets dashboards without a much faster engine. And so I pursued kind of a more infrastructure play. That's what Rill uh, right. uh So you created a new company example. called Rill. And in fact, yes. it continued on its own, trying to create like the next generation MetaMarkets. So then another year goes by, and Jim is working on this on his own. And maybe it's maybe the new facet isn't that exciting. It's not going that well. But old meta markets are still throwing off cash like crazy. So I, I call Jim again, and I'm like, hey, Jim, why don't I buy a facet? <laughs> Once again, beeswax facet. I'm like, this is fine. We can make it work. I put, I put a term sheet in front of him. But in the meantime, I'm starting to get interested in buying beeswax. Um, this is in 2020 during the pandemic time. And so I'm a little worried that doing a deal with him might mess up my other situation. So we're kind of like trying to do a fancy deal that doesn't have a lot of risk and blah, blah, blah. And he, he basically says, no, nah, I'm going a different direction. And then he sells the business to you again. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well... The, the the true chain of events there is that he actually sold Facet back to Snap. So yes. what, happened, what, what happened was that when he decided to go and pursue kind of a Metamarkets 2.0, he brought in an extremely talented uh, commercial exec, who I think many of us know, Kevin Weatherman, who was also at you know, previously MoPub and before that Pubmatic. And Kevin, I think, successfully... Acquire, you just started to acquire customers for this new um, a facet application. But I think that, again, this is my a, a bit of an outsider's view. The ACVs might not have been high enough or the TAM was not big enough. And meanwhile, I think Snap had an interest in continuing to develop. They need to build their in-house analytics platform, that essentially their, their continuance of uh, meta markets. And so Jim sold facet back to Snap. And then... Snap approached me and said, we still have this thing. Can you help us? Man, We don't want to have to pull the plug on these MetaMarkets customers that have been running on this platform for years. Can you help us? And so the real chain of custody was Facet spun out of Snap, Jim sold it back to Snap, and then I actually licensed the technology, the MetaMarkets technology from Snap. So it was kind of, a, it's been a ping pong ball, but um, I actually, I should say, I acquired the technology and I licensed it. I gave them a perpetual license back to it as part of that. Part of so that. The deal. current state of play is that Snap has the MetaMarkets technology; they use it. You have all the customers, and you're building new tech on Rill. That's the current. That's state. right. All exactly. Right. And the logic. Everyone of the deal followed that. that. <laughs> <laughs> it was literally. It was so complicated that when we were doing, when we started Rill, we actually had a slide deck. It was like two slides that were like. Here's the history of the of the IP because we were like we were like real. Aren't you guys are meta markets? But wait, wasn't there a facet? And hold on, it's what about not even that? that big a company? Like that's the thing. We're not talking yeah. about a billion dollar company. Um, it's got totally. very convoluted. One word on it's, Kevin Weatherman. You know he's a very good salesperson because whenever I see him, he gives me a hard time for not hiring him as CRO of Beeswax, even though he never applied. <laughs> Well, that's that's Kevin's MO. He's like, why would I apply? You know, I'm here. I'm I know available. that's what he says. Call me. Right. exactly. Just call me. All right, this is this has been awesome. Let's we're gonna take a break and we're gonna do the news of the week. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. Um, a lot of news this week, including the IB response uh, and a bunch of MFA news and other things. So let's take a break. This architecture podcast is sponsored by Adelaide. 
Remember Where's Waldo? He was 100% viewable, but still awfully hard to find. Your digital ads are like Waldo. Viewable, but in a sea of distraction. You need to move beyond viewability. Adelaide helps brands like Mars, Audi, Colgate, and the NBA measure media quality and drive better performance by optimizing campaigns programmatically with attention data. Adelaide's metric, AU, is available at nearly every major DSP and SSP, making it easy to leverage attention metrics. Get a free Waldo was viewable t-shirt at adelaidemetrics.com slash Waldo. And we're back. Uh, we had to take a brief break because we were all laughing so hard at the uh, the, the history of Metamarkets and Real and Jim Payne. Um, but let's get into the news of the week. So we have a, we have a bunch of stuff here. Uh, late breaking, I guess, um, a few minutes prior to recording, uh, R and I got an email from last week's guest, Alex Cohn, which by the way, I mean, everybody loved and you know continues to talk about saying that uh, Google has released a response to basically the IAB's comment on Privacy Sandbox. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I'll take a quick look and then we'll do this episode with Mike. I open it and it's 34 pages long. <laughs> so I didn't do anything. Um, sounds like Ari, right, you might have done a little bit more. I haven't I'll had throw it to you. I haven't had time to really do it, but I think it kind of tracks against some of the things that I mentioned in our newsletter last week. I'll, I'll give you a quote. This is Google responding to the IB. The analysis contains many misunderstandings and inaccuracies, which we consider it important to correct in order to provide accurate information to the ecosystem. And then the next paragraph here, the privacy sandbox provide building blocks, blah, blah, blah. They are not designed to offer one-to-one replacement for third-party cookies or cross-size identifiers. Um, I think that's a key point because one of the headlines from last week that only a small number of the 44 use cases are supported. And I don't think anyone should assume that the privacy sandbox is going to replace every single use case. So I'm going to read this and maybe put some of this in the weekly newsletter that comes out on Monday, but I'd probably encourage people to check it out themselves as well. All 34 pages. Um, Mike, does privacy sandbox and, you know, all of this like insanity that's happening in ad tech, even though, you know, like ad tech is a customer base for you, you're not in ad tech. Does this stuff do you look at this? Does it matter significantly to, to real? Is it on your radar or is this just like, you know, completely uh, secondary? I think anyone that's in the business of, of managing or working with, you know, customer data, this impacts. So what I observe is that part of what's going on is this is a, it's a little bit of a, um, there's a walled garden play here that's happening where I saw our fellow uh, ad tech exec, Kamakshi, um, Sold her company quietly uh, to Snowflake yep. um, to build their privacy offering. I think it was Samua was the name of the the business. Right. So I think it's actually what the customers are asking for. But I also think there's an element here where if you can play the privacy card, you can start to say, okay, all all of their data needs to be in inside our privacy sandbox. This is the safe place to share data with your partners. And it's it, it can be a very effective way to, I think, prevent customers from using you know other platforms. So that would be my read on it. But uh, I think it's important for sure. All right. Let's talk about, I was going to say MFA news, but it's a little bit more just like inventory quality news. So there's three, three pieces that came out this week. Uh, the first one was uh, Double Verify is apparently now going to market with a tool that classifies MFA in some sort of, I think, three-step system, you know, red, yellow, green, one, two, three, bad, super bad, awful. I don't know exactly how it's being done, but I thought it was interesting. There was a good write-up in uh, Ad Exchanger on this one. I'll throw it to you, uh, Ari. What, what do you think of this idea of, you know, basically there are shades of gray in MFA and it's not just all binary, like it's MFA or not MFA. It's kind of connected to how Chris from Jones thinks about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Uh, Chris uh, did a really good job of talking through that. I think it was interesting that the DV conversation included some phrases about um, these sites may still drive some performance when I think most true MFA sites would not drive performance except through, you know, some sort of misguided attribution system. So I, I think that DV as a measurement provider is finding itself in the situation where they have to keep the customers happy and some customers want to continue to get the reach and use these sites and some don't. Um, it's a tough position to be in and some 
vendors, some DSPs are cutting them off entirely, and maybe that's not in the client's interest in all cases. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, again, it's, it's almost back to the Chris conversation where MFA is sometimes not exactly what we all think about it in terms of classification, where it's a random page that, you know, buys traffic on Facebook and just like stuffs 100 ads and 30 video ads in a, in a user session. It could be just a site that is not arranged correctly, perhaps maybe has like one too many ads on it, doesn't load. So it's like, you know, there needs to be, I think, more um, more science to like understanding what good publisher UX is. And maybe this is a step in that direction. Yeah, agreed. So somewhat related, and you know, this was one that, you know, a lot of conversation on was uh, there's a new product from Trade Desk called, I think, TD500 or SP, SP it literally S&P, literally S&P 500. All right, cool. Good for them. So it is a, uh, a collection of 500 uh, presumably premium publisher properties, not sites, but like properties or media sellers that they're basically creating a you know, meta PMP or an ad network or some way to very quickly sort of get you know some sort of aggregated reach across 500 publishers. What do you think of this, Ari? Well, this one really has the tinfoil hats coming out a lot. Half the people on X are like, oh, boy, you created a list of 500 publishers. Congratulations. Uh, put out a press release, <laughs> which is a pretty good reaction. And then the other reaction is um, sort of, wow, Jeff's done it again. This is brilliant. This is going to clean up the ecosystem. And then there's kind of the third level reaction, which is this is step one to forcing everyone to use open path because you'll have to use open path to be one of these 500 and we're going to eliminate all the SSPs. Hmm. So I don't know. I I think it's, it seems like just a little bit of a marketing gimmick to me, by the way, S and P stands for seller and publisher, not like standard and poor's. I, it, I'm, I'm left a little unenthusiastic. What do you think, Mike? Well, I, the only comment I'll make is on the previous, on the previous MFA observations is that I, I do think, the, maybe it's been discussed in the, on the market texture podcast already. I do think that the big risk right now, systemic risk to this industry is AI um, search and things like perplexity because so many of the ways in which I consume MFA sites is frankly recipes, you know, searching for a recipe to cook. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of these um, sites have had an unhealthy relationship with Google who obviously benefits tremendously from you know those uh, the the ad load, and I think that yeah a, the AI content uh, is a systemic risk to a lot of the MFA stuff and to publishers more broadly potentially. You know, bringing this back to meta markets for a minute, one of the reasons why people love meta markets was because, in contrast to the sort of DSP SSP reporting, which might be updated every couple of hours and might have weird aggregations and stuff, in meta markets you could see in near real time where your ads were running, and you just add add the domain as a field, and boom, you'd find some weird ass domains that you shouldn't have been there, and add them to your exclude list right away. Uh, and that's like the kind of on the wire trading that people want in digital that they have in finance, to be frank. Um, and meta markets really was the first tool that let people do that. Very true. You know, there was one thing, Jay Friedman, uh, who we've had on the, on the pod before, uh, CEO of, of Goodway Group, that, you know, he commented on this whole SP500 thing, which I thought was interesting, was, you know, basically like, you know, there's uh, some, you know, curation happening or cu curation products that are being done, you know, by agencies or, or agency like companies that this is, you know, basically going to obviate. So, you know, maybe it's like, you know, w one step closer to a little bit more transparency, a little bit, you know, less, you know, sort of like blind markups um, on, you know, what is aggregated inventory. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I have big news this week, which is that um, Jeff Green responded to a comment of mine on LinkedIn. So I feel, like, yeah, I know. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to wash my keyboard again. Like that's like the big, big, big moment for me. What did he say? He said something about like astute analysis, but I don't agree entirely about the stages of grief for my last art. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, one final point. Uh, I, I would uh, encourage everybody to read the um, the deep dive on analytics uh, that James Hercher from uh, uh, Ad Exchanger did. It was it was pretty awesome. 
All right, moving on. Um, so CTV, a couple of, actually three three cool things in, in the CTV land. Uh, so first, more on TTD. Uh, TTD's open path is now in CTV, starting with, or including Vizio and Cox. Important, significant, or, you know, just incremental? What do you think, Ari? I think it's an important step, and I'm not sure how well it's going to work out. Um, I, I think the CTV CPMs are so high that taking out a, a hop there could be very um, meaningful in terms of the amount of money that goes to the publisher and how the working dollars work. The thing that makes me a little skeptical is how complicated the CTV ad decisioning process is um, in terms of pods and competitive exclusions and you know, all those sort of things. And I'm unclear exactly how the trade desk would be able to handle those if they're sort of acting like a dumb pipe from the publisher to their trading system. Um, but I'll wait and see and hear more as it develops. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. And you know, I think that's where the stickiness of SpringServe with, with Magnite comes from, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's why uh, they were forced to get go up the stack into the ad serving world with SpringServe. And so you have SpringServe... Publica, and, which is a sponsor of this uh, podcast, and uh, and Freewheel, all of whom are implementing very complicated business logic for the CTV media companies, and it's not really clear where Trade Desk comes in there, except as a bidder. It's it's less it's less simple than with Display, where I think some of these kind of collapsing of DSPs, SSPs, and exchanges um, was a big story from from last year. More in CTV news, uh, and speaking of Vizio, so this one is is big, and I'd love to get both of your takes on this. Um, there is rumor that Walmart uh, is looking at acquiring Vizio for two billion dollars, and much of the thesis, or maybe you know, everybody in ad tech always just thinks about ads. Much of the thesis is you know you can connect this to Walmart Connect, which um, is apparently uh, already you saw us at a four point five billion dollar business. To use it, you know, in all sorts of ways uh, to to have more ads to sell, to do closed loop attribution, all this neat stuff. What what do you guys think, Mike? I'll, I'll start with you. It it feels like every company in the world has woken up uh, to the possibility of extraordinary high margin um, advertising dollars as a way to uh, you know, juice their profits. I mean, it's, it's become a question whether Instacart is actually an advertising business and not a grocery delivery business given the yield. So I think the incredible thing that Amazon has always had is the ability to close the loop. Um, you can actually know what the return, you know, what we all talk about ROAS, but let's face it, like Amazon actually is, is probably the king of ROAS measurement. Walmart is, you know, positioned to actually close the loop for anyone that sees an ad for, you know, Huggies on their Vizio Walmart TV, goes to Walmart and buys Huggies, like, there you go. It's, so I think it's an incredible and somewhat natural evolution if they pull it off. Uh, the question really is whether, whether Walmart has the, the tech chops to put all these pieces together. They've always been kind of a late mover, but they eventually get there. I think Walmart.com has eventually gotten there. So we'll see if they can, you know, uh, if they can make something like this work. Yeah, I, I have to double down on that. Attribution is all is what it's all about. Being able to sell TV ads and also measure TV ads through the living room with a stable IP address that is tied to a login that's tied to your Walmart shopping card that has the number one grocery seller in America associated with it. That that is just awe inspiring. And I, I've I've been bringing this up for years that I thought that a big part of Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods was about attribution. But there's some problems with that, which is the Whole Foods doesn't have nearly the footprint of, of Walmart. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the Whole Foods product lines or SKUs are not common high volume SKUs. They're a specialty retailer. Um, and so while the attribution promise was exciting for Fire TV and Walmart, it's uh, it's a little bit hard to make those pieces fit together. One last point is about two years ago, or maybe two and a half years ago, the Wall Street Journal ran a report that Comcast and Walmart had an agreement to build TVs. 
And I don't think anything ever came of that. And I'm, I'm specifically referencing that because I was a Comcast employee at the time, so I don't want to use any inside information. But um, the report said that they were going to jointly be building TVs to be sold at Walmart, running Comcast's uh, Xfinity or whatever it's called operating system. And I don't think that ever came to market. Um, so that's an interesting path here. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I, I did. I read a, as much as I could on this one. And um Two data points on on just like TVs. So Vizio is uh, basically twenty percent of the U.S. smart TV market. So I mean it's significant. Um, and uh, Walmart has a private label uh, smart TV that is powered by Roku. So if they had done that deal with Comcast, I don't, I don't think the the, the private label right. one w- would exist. Roku traded down on on the news. But I don't know if that was uh, was completely right. I really have to believe that Roku would be in a bidding war, if not for the Department of Justice and the FTC cracking down on tech mergers. Um, you can see Roku at yeah. at Meta. You can see Roku at really so many different acquirers could be excited about that asset. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, hey, f- final bit on on CTV, and this might be the the last one we we hit on um, in in the news of ad tech CTV. Ari Papari has joined the board of of Vive. And I don't know if I said there was a press release, but there was this like incredible (laughs) picture (laughs) that they posted. Some artist created of you ceremonially joining the board. I mean, it was was really It really was something. Um, So the press release went out on Valentine's Day. And so they made like a bachelor illusion where I was accepting or maybe I was giving a rose to the founders of Vibe. And all I'll say is this is a very exciting company. It's very hot. They're growing like crazy. They're, They're in the space of letting small advertisers buy CTV and TV. Great founding team. And I'm not going to say but and they're French and they're based in Paris and they're wonderful people. And sometimes the humor, you know, comes across a little strange. And so um, I'm very excited and I love these guys and I love their weird little illustration they did of me. And um, I'm excited to move forward with it. Well, congrats on that. And congrats to them. Um, getting getting you on the board uh, is uh, is pretty awesome. Um, I think we're probably out of time, so we'll we'll leave it here. Uh, Mike, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Ari. Always a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for subscribing to Marketecture. New interviews are added every week at Marketecture.tv and your favorite podcasting app.